right, let's go ahead and get started. The word of the day, Sunnyside. I'm not sure if it gets to get me credit actually for this. But in for it. Um, some of you may wonder, looking up here, looking at the handout, what this has to do with allergies. And I would venture nothing, uh, or almost nothing. I would say just the opposite. I would say everything. <laughs> everything? Yeah. All right. Because it explains everything in the universe. An allergy is a small part of that. I see. Right. That's the broader perspective on life. So for those of you who are new to the room, to these sessions, you may wonder what's going on here today. This has been a long-standing tradition with Gary and myself who are friends for more years than I think you should be a member. You should be friends until this topic. I see. <laughs> so just to give you a, a flavor in, in the past, so traditionally I've given him a topic that doesn't have anything to do with allergy, often has nothing to do with medicine whatsoever, just because all of us are curious people and like to know things. So some of the memorable ones that he's done in the past were the history of English literature, uh, winemaking, volcanism, and tectonic plates, uh, Einstein's brain, which had to do with not just Einstein's brain, but how we learn. Um, what are some of the other memorable ones? Um, I know people tell me years later, they don't remember any of the scientific talks. The only one they remember <laughs> is this one. So he's going to do a fact, fantastic job. So this is named something like Cosmology for the Practicing Allergies from the Big Bang until now. Gary. I don't know if I want to thank uh, Len for this topic. He assigns them. I don't choose them, by the way. Although I do love this kind of stuff. Uh, the only problem is I don't understand it. Uh, now, this is the mand uh, mandatory disclosure side. side and as you know, I, this always bothers me, and I hate to have to fill out forms for a rating. But I realize that as this uh, sign says, hey, you stop whining about civil liberties. A police state is a safe state. So I guess uh, there is some <laughs> value. Say a Trump it. state. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, the, the talk is going to uh, focus on, I say the new physics is over 100 years old, a lot of it, uh, going back to Einstein. But it explains most of the following, the not, well, just about everything, the creation of the universe, the fate of the universe, the origin of the universe, the fate of matter in the end, the relationship of matter and energy, of course, with Einstein stuff, and, and basically, in essence, it explains everything. That's all you need to know. Now, I'm going to talk about things in the cosmology from the youngest things in the universe to the oldest. I didn't have Nick's slides, so I'm sorry. I didn't really put Len in there. That's my uh, granddaughter, Lexi, over there. Guess who's in the middle? That's Drew. <laughs> once that was, it's hard to believe that he was once a cute kid. What about the picture of him on the pot? Yeah, I do have that one. Put his flippers on. What are you talking about? Now, just so people don't fall asleep during my talk, there's going to be a quiz, and you could be asked on the quiz at the end, so you better pay attention. Here are the questions, and so you can go down and keep track and, and see if you can align the best answers in the column on the left to match the best answer on the right. Uh, drug uh, people are also responsible. <laughs> All right. Start with the two great revolutions in understanding the universe in the 20th century. And the first one of the two by Einstein, basically, a special relativity and general relativity. Uh, the, in 1905, he came up with special relativity, which is the behavior of the universe on a large scale. He was looking at constant velocities, not acceleration, which he does in the, uh, the subsequent in 1915 on general relativity. And he surmised the inextricable relationship of space and time. They are inseparable. They are basically uh, uh, dimensions of the universe to look at. And he called it space-time. The, the key issue in understanding this is the fact that life is a constant speed in all frames of reference, which is counterintuitive because we think things will move differently whether you have a different frame of reference. But that's not the case, and that changes everything. There is uh, 
a scientist called Lorenz who uh, was able to simplify this in a way to make it more understandable using transformations. And this is the gamma factor. And it's hard to see the equation down here, but this is, uh, specifically shows time and how time changes when you start approaching the speed of light. Now, this, it's blocked in the lower corner, and you can't see that this is going to go up asymptotically rapidly. Now, at slower speeds, it doesn't uh, have any effect uh, at all. The, the Lorentz factor is that, uh, that gamma there with 1 over the square root of 1 minus the, the rest of that equation. You know, it's a hard to understand uh, uh, relativity and time dilation, but I'm trying to simplify it. Looking at the equation, you know, velocity is equal to the distance over time. Now, if you look at time being, uh, the, or the, uh, the speed being the speed of light, which is constant in all frames, and you say, well, the, uh, the numerator, you increase the distance, the only way to keep the uh, speed of light the same is to dilate the time. So that's kind of an intuitive way to you know, figure out uh, relativity and why time slows down. To keep the speed the same, if you go a longer distance, you've got to slow down the time. And that's what this uh, uh, Lorentz transformation shows. Now, not only does time slow down with speed, and I, I've got the equation there, t is equal to gamma, that, that equation up above time time. But the other thing that's key here is that the mass increases with speed. You say, well, why does mass increase with speed? Because as you increase the speed, some of that kinetic energy is transformed into mass. You know, now, this is what Einstein figured out. And so as, as mass approaches the speed of light, it becomes heavier and heavier and heavier until it becomes infinite mass as it's going up this curve. And you could put m in here for mass, and you get the, basically the same uh, the printout on this. So that's a key issue, and that's where he came up with, uh, you know, mass equals mc squared. That's how the mass changes as you start approaching the speed of light. Now, it, another factor is that, be, that length changes with the speed of light, except it's inversely, so it, it's equal to gamma div, uh, over the length. So things shorten up as you go faster and faster. The other thing that is known is that, uh, and actually this was uh, figured out by Maxwell before him, that this uh, speed of light is basically the speed limit of the universe. But there are a couple of things I'm going to talk about that go faster than the speed of light. Recently, some people suggested that you could exceed the speed of light. They were wrong, but... I... Anything with mass can't, so that is correct. But a, a space-time, which is not mass, can expand faster than the speed of light. And it did at the time of inflation of the universe, and it may do it at the end when you have what we call the big rip, when the universe tears apart, that, it can, that uh, space-time can move faster, but mass can't. Okay, you remember that space from the, the Big Bang, it's space that's expanding from the Big Bang, uh, Big Bang rather. And, and that can, at least in theory, go faster than the speed of light. Now, as I said, he showed that E equals mc squared, showing that the mass increases you approach the speed of light. And that so mass and energy are interchangeable. The upshot ups, uh, of this that came out of this was, of course, the issue about uh, generating tremendous amounts of power, especially in the form of a bomb. Uh, when they showed that uh, uh, you could have chain reactions, which is in the late 30s, that could ignite bombs, Einstein contacted Roosevelt at that time, saying that Germany may be able to do this before us, and that got the whole Manhattan Project going. Uh, now, you have the both the nuclear fission, where the, you split the atoms, and you have nuclear fusion, where you have fusion of atoms, and they both can result in a tremendous amount of the release of energy. Now, uh, there would be a pointer on the... Yeah, oh, I got a pointer here. Yeah. It's hard to see from this angle, by the way. Turn around. Easier to see. My pointer, there you are. Okay, anyhow, this is... Oops. This is the fish inside over here. Now I lost my pointer. There it is. It's not very good one. Anyhow. And so, uh, basically, as most of you are familiar with it, you can make it from uranium-235, which there's very little of that isotope, and you have to pure it from the 238 
So what happens is that you can have what are called fission reactions where you get splitting of the atoms. It's an endothermic reaction, so all you have to have is enough of the critical mass of the <coughs> substance to get the uh, chain reaction started. And that is uh, the, uh, what is generated from uranium-type bombs. And then, of course, it develops those radioactive products that come out, plus the release of energy. The energy that kills people is mainly from the heat and the explosion, not from radiation. Uh, and the heat and radiation uh, generated is profound. It gets much harder than the inside, hotter than the inside of the sun, and of course causes fires every place too, which destroys things. Now, nuclear fusion, which is generally with hydrogen in, in the form of deuterium and tritium, uh, unite. You, this is an endothermic act reaction, so you have to generate uh, uh, energy to get that uh, reaction going. And so you have to have another nuclear bomb, basically, to set off the hydrogen bomb, if you will, uh, because it's endothermic. But it releases a lot more heat and energy, although it doesn't have the significant radioactive products. It's cleaner. Now, going on to general relativity, relativity, which he published 10 years later, <laughs> this included acceleration and gravity. And the big things that came out of this is that gravity is equal to acceleration, or acceleration equal to gravity. And it is due to the curvature of space, he showed. Gravity uh, curves space-time. Now, I have a terrible typo on this. I made this slide a long time ago, and I didn't go back and read it until last night. Time is actually... Yeah, but faster on the top of a, oh, it's correct on this, but not on your. Time goes slower uh, on the, uh, when, uh, let me start over. Time goes faster when you're on the top of a mountain as opposed to being on sea level. And they can show these with these atomic clocks, how accurate they are, that that gravity slows down time, just like energy, speech uh, slows down time. It also predicts the Big Bang from a singularity when you do the math, which is incredibly complicated. I don't pretend to understand. Uh, the thing about it is that when Einstein went through this, that the information predicted that the universe was not static, and he didn't like that. He didn't like the fact that the universe seemed to be moving and was in constant motion and, and could have gone either larger or smaller. So he added what we call the cosmologic constant to create a static universe. And that'll come into importance when we talk about uh, uh, dark energy in, in the future. His information also predicted that there were black, black holes. In other words, you could have so much gravity that it, you would form a singularity. Now, another way to look at gravity is that it has its effects on space-time. And, and on the left, uh, gravity, uh, looking at it like a rubber sheet, matter tells space how to curve. Curved space tells matter how to move. Now, uh, the picture on the right just shows the, the, what I was saying about gravity's an effect on time. That uh, people on top of the Earth feel like uh, the, the clock is running faster than those down on the ground. Another way to look at space time, and you can't see it very well because it's covered down here, is this shows, uh, you know, it, uh, uh, light traveling, of course, it's bent by gravity, and it takes longer to get to the other side, which you can't see there. It's another way to look at time dilation. In other words, the way gravity slows down time by bending it. Now, <coughs> Einstein said this, when forced to summarize the general theory of relativity in one sentence, is that time and space and graviton have no separate existence from matter. In fact, so they're all inextricably linked and a change in one affects the other. Now, this is the way Einstein used to feel, I'm sure. <laughs> it says, freeze. Okay, now, who's the brains of this outfit? And I was going to say, this is kind of like when we go in a room and Len is there. Except I decided not to because I thought it might go to his uh, head. <laughs> All right, the second major re revolution was quantum mechanics. And, of course, this was the behavior of the universe on a subatomic scale, just the opposite of uh, general relativity. It's called quantum, as most of you might realize, because energy comes in discrete units and in discrete energy levels. 
And in the 1920s, these incredible geniuses, Heisenberg and Schrodinger and others, developed a quantum mechanical model to describe atomic structure, highly mathematical. It was based on probability and constructive wave interference. The solution uh, is complex equations, but it comes out predicting where orbits uh, are and probability clouds for electrons in an atom. And it explains atomic and subatomic structure. And, and theoretically, they predicted many particles, which eventually they were able to prove existed and uh, many of them being proven recently by particle accelerators, accelerators like at CERN, the so-called Large Hadron Collider. But the, the picture on the right just shows the quantum levels. They, they have discrete energy levels, and they release a discrete energy. And this the slide on the right just shows the probability clouds. Now, the bizarre aspects of quantum mechanics, and there are plenty, is that you can't really define a thing as a wave and a particle separately. They are inextricably linked and they have effects on each other. So you have to look at um, what we call particles as waves as well. They propagate like waves, but they also behave like particles. The other crazy thing about analyzing all this stuff is the actual physical observation of things at quantum level uh, influence the behavior of those particles as you're looking at them. So it changes the whole game. It, we, they call it the collapse of wave function. Are, are there any physics majors in here? Could you explain it to me? <laughs> really, it is hard. But you, when you look at something, you influence its behavior when you measure it mathematically or, or, or measure it in, in a, a whatever way scientifically you can. So it does alter what you can interpret, and, and there are multiple interpretations depending on how you do it and who looked at it. So, at any rate, that's a picture of Heisenberg up in, in, a, in a corner. And he is the one that came up with the uncertainty principle that you can look at position and momentum, but you can't define one if, if you try to precisely define the other. And in other words, the world is governed by uh, probability or quantum states. Now, in other words, there is nothing certain in the world. Probably the only thing certain in the world I can think of now is that the Mariners are probably going to have another losing season. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, it also explains virtual particles. Are you guys familiar with vir virtual particles? Those are particles that come out of a vacuum. It, you know, at, at, at microscopic dimensions, the universe is seething even in a... In a uh, vacuum, and we'll talk about that a little bit. One of the most curious things is quantum entanglement, that things can act at a distance instantaneously. If you have two particles that are entangled, and one has a spin going up, the other one has to have a spin going down. But again, it doesn't affect that spin until you observe it. But you can observe it on one end, you know, and maybe separated by infinite space almost. And when you observe it, the other one changes instantaneously. If there's no communication, how does it occur? And all they can, you can say is it occurs because quantum mechanics predicts it. And not only does it predict it, the experiments show that. It's an instantaneous thing. To it's, in other words, it's not traveling. Something happens. So uh, real curiosity here. Now, I, I kind of went through this and analyzed it myself. And, it, and just to make things simpler for you, I wrote out a few equations. <laughs> Anyhow, this is this is to me is not much different than the, all the people who put up the signal transduction slides that people do here for our field. So, at any rate, now going through the fundamental particles, and when I say fundamental particles, I mean particles that can't be subdivided into smaller particles. Up to 1964, when uh, uh, Len was out of college, there were only three particles described: the electron, the neutron, and the proton. Now there are 51, okay? And many are proven in particle accelerators like CERN, including the recently elusive uh, Higgs particle, or the so-called God particle. Particles now include quarks with the building blocks of hadrons, which are neutrons, and protons, leptons, like the electrons, bosons, the energy forces, and all the antiparticles. The one we'll probably never be able to prove, but it's, pro uh, uh, it's theoretical, is the so-called graviton. Now, how do 
do we come up with all these uh, uh, particles? Well, primordial nucleosynthesis occurred just after the Big Bang, and 99% of that was hydrogen and helium, so you have to generate all the other elements, and I'll tell how in here in just a second. Essentially, all the other elements formed, up to, uh, formed in stars. Uh, up to iron, which is very stable elements, that is in your regular burning stars. However, elements higher than iron and up to uranium and plutonium are formed only by supernovas. Again, those are endothermic reactions. You have to have a super explosion to form those things. I was looking up what's the highest atomic number now, and it's un un -octium. And you say, well, why did they name it un un -octium? Actually, there's logic to it. Un is one. One, one, Another one is one, and octium is eight. So they named it that. Now, when they name the particle after Bill Henderson, they'll name it the Henderson particle, but right now that's the, that's the name. So. <laughs> All right, now properties of particles. They have mass, and the mass is created by Higgs bosons, which I'll talk about. A uh, uh, definition of mass is a resistance to change of speed or direction. They have electric charge, at least some of them, and mostly are integer, but quarks are fractional, like uh, plus a third and minus, uh, or plus a third and two thirds. There's color charge. It has nothing to do with color, but it has to do with describing the strong force which is involved in holding quarks together. There is spin, and I kind of referred to it before uh, when I was talking about particles uh, acting on each other at infinity. Uh, it is a magnetic property that's quantized and fixed, and all matter has a spin in its equation and description according to quantum mechanics. Fermions have half energy or spin, and the only reason to know that anything with half energy, uh, half energy and spin is matter, whereas bosons have energy and spin, like one or zero or two, and uh, they are uh, forces. They, they uh, generally don't have mass except for a few. Uh, Pauli exclusion principle, you may remember from high school physics, where shows that identical fermions, uh, in other words, matter with half integer spin, cannot occupy the same quantum state. And, and that's important, because otherwise you just have plasma. This leads to the structure of the atoms. And there is the term symmetry, and I'm only throwing this out because it's critical for understanding how we got all the mass in the universe. Generally, uh, the laws of physics are obeyed by electromagnetic uh, force, uh, gravity, the weak uh, but not by the weak force, excuse me. And that's the one uh, force that you don't have the symmetry of so-called charge. In other words, reversing the charge, the universe should act pr pretty much the same with that reverse charge. Mirror images should pretty much behave the same as mirror image. And time reversal, which you can do on uh, uh, you know, quantum scales, are reversible. However, it's key that the, the weak force doesn't obey it, and it's the only way, uh, only reason we have a universe. <coughs> now, field theory. This is something to uh, explain mathematically particles and wavicles, and it's incredibly complicated, and I'll tell you, I really didn't understand it a lot. It's uh, basically that something that exists throughout space and time as opposed to being a discrete particle. A particle, uh, and this is because a particle behaves both as a wave and a particle, the wavicle. And it depends what, how you perceive it, depending on how you analyze it or observe it. You look at particles as areas of field quanta, kind of like on this drawing here. You can see where they in, uh, have a picture of it, what looks like a particle on, on the background there. There are vector fields that are directed like electricity, scalar fields that are not directed like heat. And the most uh, important one, at least for the purpose of this talk, is the gauge field. Uh, theory. And it's a property of a field where one physical quantity is changed and it causes a change in the whole system at once. Now again, I have no idea this is too complicated, but it expresses it mathematically for people to know what they're doing. But you should be familiar with the terms like quantum electrodynamics. That's this gauge theory that I'm talking about now with, for electromagnetic field exchange of photons between particles and quantum chromodynamics. Remember I was telling you they call it color change, charge. That has to do with the gauge theory of the strong force and how quarks are held together by gluons. Now, the next slide describes how I felt looking at this information. <coughs> I never did really open the door to understanding the, field, the, uh, the gauge uh, field theory. 
but it, I, I, I got an intuitive sense that it does something that at least uh, geniuses can figure out what's going on. So. Hey Gary, a couple yeah. of years ago they were trying to find an underground place to study some particle and Cowboy Mountain in this Cascades was one of their potential sites. Do you know which, they had, they had to be underground like 10 miles or something. Do you know what that one was? Yeah, they're looking for neutrinos. Neutrinos. Neutrinos, right now you've got billions of them piercing your, well, not right now because we're in shape, but in the sunlight, billions are piercing you, and they are so neutral and they're so non-interactive. They only interact with the weak force, and so there's so much uh, background noise and everything above ground, you have to go way down to get rid of most of the background noise. And then you have to have something that, re that reacts with a weak force that uh, the neutrino hits. But it's only going to hit one in ten trillion, trillion, trillion times. But they're looking for uh, the emission of, of, of light when it hits the, uh, something that it can react with. But that's what they're looking at, neutrinos. Now, the fundamental particles, we're going to start with the quarks, which are the building blocks of neutrons and protons. It came from uh, Finnegan's Wake. Did anybody ever try to read Finnegan's Wake? <laughs> too hard. Okay. Anyhow, in the book he says three quarks for Mr. Mark. And, of course, there are three uh, basic uh, quarks. Now, there are six flavors in three possible colors. And they call them red, blue, and green, but it has nothing to do with color. It just has to do with discrete uh, individual uh, particles that contribute to charge. Uh, mathematically, they explain also the Pauli exclusion principle for hadrons because you had to have three different distinct particles. And they proved this by throwing light at protons and neutrons and showing the way they bent off and said there has to be a, a, an infrastructure with three things there. And that's how they proved that. Anyhow, you have up and down quarks, which have up as a positive two thirds and a down quark a minus one third charge, okay? And uh, then they have heavier ones, the strange and the charm and the top and the bottom that were discovered that are only important basically uh, in high energy physics or the Big Bang. So you can ignore that for all practical purposes, but they're there. And they were predicted by quantum mechanics and they found them. So anyhow, like I said, they are the building blocks of, of uh, hadrons, which are protons and neutrons, the major matter. And these slides on the right show the different colors that you have to have. The thing about it is quarks have to be, in quotes, colorless. So you have to have three different colors if you're having a proton and a neutron. Uh, the three, you know, you know, the red, green, and blue, neutralize either, and they call it white. Uh, now, mesons are also made up of quarks, but they're a quark and an anti-quark uh, pair, but that's a neutral color as well. But those are the, the important hadrons. Now, now you have the leptons, and the leptons are basically like the electrons. They don't feel the strong force of the gluons that I'll discuss, but they feel they do feel electromagnetic force, and it's the basis of all chemistry. There are three families, uh, kind of like the uh, quarks. They have six flavors. They don't have the three colors, so they're a little simpler. They have negative charge and neutral pairs. Now, I was just talking about neutrinos that Paul brought up, and they have the uh, electron and they have the neutral equivalent particle called an electron neutrino or neutrino for short. And as I was just telling you, uh, they are 50,000 times smaller than an electron, but 65 billion pierce each centimeter squared of our bodies each second when the sun exposed. But they don't do anything because they're neutral. Now, the heavier ones I, uh, are listed below, but again, they're not uh, important for all practical purposes except in very high energy states. Now we've got four forces in the universe and they have their particles as well that I'll discuss next. You have the strong nuclear force that only acts at, uh, at uh, very small subatomic ranges and I'm going to give it a value of one as the strongest. Electromagnetic force is long range but only interacts with charged particles and it's about a hundredth the uh, strength of the nuclear force, or the strong nuclear force. The weak nuclear force has also, is like the strong, it only has short ranges, uh, working at subatomic range, uh, ranges, but it, has, uh, it is the cause of nuclear decay in atoms. And there are uh, three other particles, the W, W, and the Z, and I'll talk about that in a bit. And lastly, gravity, which is actually the dominant force in the universe, but it's by, by far the weakest, is 10 to the minus 40th as strong as the 
nuclear, strong nuclear force, and uh, of course the hypothetical graviton, which I just allege may never be discovered because it's so non-interactive and the force is so weak. Just briefly on electromagnetic force, the one you're probably all familiar with, of course, you have photons that only act with interactive charged particles. This causes electrons to orbit nuclei, and it, it results in the attractions that form the molecules that are the basis of all chemical reactions. It has a spin one, and again, that means it's a, it's a, um, a, a force and not, doesn't have mass. It has infinite range, however, all over the universe, although it takes time to travel. Now, going back, remember I alluded to the uh, field theories, and they call it QED, or the quantum electrodynamics, is the uh, mathematical description is, of this as a force field. One thing to remember about photons, you talk about light, it isn't just visible light, it's everything from gamma rays to radio waves are transmitted by photons. <laughs> Now, the strong nuclear force is held together by gluons, and it turns out there are eight of them, and they have zero mass. They are made up of color and anti-color, force-carrying pairs like thrown in, shown those buckets up there on the right. They hold the quarks together, and they have tremendous uh, energy uh, contained. Now, I talked to you before about mesons. They're quark anti-quark functions are that are pairs that function like a boson, like an energy particle. They have zero mass, and they keep the hadrons together. They're not important in keeping the, uh, the, glue, uh, the uh, quarks together, but they're important in, in keeping the neutrons and protons together. Anyhow, if you try to pull a quark apart, it actually increases the energy, and you increase the energy so much, if you pull far enough apart, you create another quark. See, there are no free quarks. Uh, it's like there's no free lunch. All right. Anyhow, incredibly complicated stuff, very sophisticated. Like I said, uh, trying to learn this stuff, I realize how stupid I am. But at any rate, it, it's fascinating. And the, this is the description of quantum chromodynamics on this one. Again, this is all about the strong force. This will be on your quiz. Anyhow, if you haven't been paying attention. The yeah, gauge theory we talked about, the three colors I already talked about. You can't have color, so you have to have a red, blue, and green, the three different types of quarks. You can't have two reds and a blue. They have to neutralize each other. They emit the gluons that change the color of one quark to another. And again, it's governed by quantum electrodynamics. Now again, going after this, you know, even for old allergists, at least I'm happy that Superman has the same problem. But uh, it's covered up, and it says Superman in his later years at the bottom. <laughs> the way I feel after I'm doing this topic. Yeah. All right, weak nuclear force. Let me go to this side. Halfway. All right. Weak nuclear force. There are three particles there, three vector bosons called W. The two W's are for weak, and the Z was named for zero. The uh, W particles have charge, but the uh, Z particle doesn't, or zero charge. They're equivalent to photons, but they have mass. They're a thousand times bigger than the protons, so they're huge. They have limited range and act on matter. Like I said, the Z boson has neutral charge. It behaves like a photon in the sense that it can transmit momentum and move you know, uh, electrons and other things to different energy states, but it doesn't have charge. These are responsible for the radioactivity and nuclear decay of, uh, of uh, molecules such as uranium. Uh, the W particle and the W minus are bosons, again, energy uh, particles. Uh, they are the antiparticles of each other, and they help change the charge of quarks. And so these are very important in changing neutrons to protons and protons to neutrons, which change the mass of the elements, okay? You have what is called beta minus decay, which, in, which was uh, W <coughs> negative, which changes a neutron to a proton, and you have create a positive, which changes a proton to a neutron. They release these other particles, including electrons, so-called beta emission, and that's important in medical treatment. For example, uh, you have beta emission when you're treating thyroid cancer uh, with radioactive uh, thyroid. At any rate, uh, the need to convert protons to neutrons is critical to, because you need to form 
tritium and deuterium to create the right particles to get nuclear fusion stars. So if you didn't have the weak force, you wouldn't have nuclear fusion. Now gravity is the last force and it's mediated by the graviton, hypothetically uh, uh, determined by Einstein. It's the weakest force, it is always attractive, it acts over long distances but dissipates fairly quickly at uh, one over the distance squared. It moves at the speed of light, not faster. There are recent proof with this is phenomenal, and maybe you saw it back in February. It proved gravity waves admitted what happened where there were two massive black holes that crashed together, giving off that, the uh, gravity waves. But they're so difficult to measure from such a far distance. But they were able to do it by laser interferometry. Uh, it was over here in the uh, done in Eastern Washington, and th these machines to measure differences in the waves. And what really happens is space-time is being compressed and, and expanded on a very microscopic scale. And they had a sensitivity of one part in a thousand, million, 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 one to the ten to the twentieth. This is equivalent of the distance to the newest, uh, nearest star and showing it within a hair's breadth, or width, width rather, hair's breadth, width of the accuracy, but they showed that, that gravity waves do occur. On the other hand, it'll be very hard to prove that the particle itself uh, is uh, discernible. Now lastly, you've got to remember on fundamental particles are antiparticles, and these are mirror image particles. The, uh, you have electrons, you have anti-electrons. The anti-electron is called a positron. Now, we do have PET scans that use positron emission uh, tomography, so it is re uh, relevant to uh, the medical field. When particles meet an antiparticle, they annihilate each other and release energy. Uh, similarly, you can have energy and it can uh, be changed into particle antiparticle pairs uh, from the E equals MC squared equation. And the antiparticles of the force carrying particles are themselves, so there's not, there's not an extra particle there. Now, you've got all these particles, but they don't have mass until you uh, can prove, or, uh, well, they had to prove the existence of the Higgs boson. And most of you have probably heard about that. It was in 2012 that they came up with enough evidence of, of the Higgs boson. They did not know why uh, particles had mass. but Quantum mechanics predicted there should be a Higgs boson that creates mass. And, and guess what? They did prove it. This is Peter Higgs who won the Nobel Prize for it. And who the particle was named after. The press loved it. They called it the God particle. It is a massive elementary particle, 100 to 200 times bigger than the proton. It creates a ubiquitous scalar quantum field responsible for giving particles, and again, only acting on the half integer spin, in other words, particles with mass. Uh, and it affects the mass by uh, giving it inertia or resistance to change in motion. It, it's likened to moving through molasses when you have this field. This field is ubiquitous out there in space. They created the high, large hydron collider out in CERN just for the specific purpose of, of, of looking for particles like this, and this is where, where it was discovered in 2012. Now, went through all that, we finally came up with the 61 different fundamental particles that explain matter and energy and their interactions. It's not impossible that we'll find smaller particles out of these ones that look like they're fundamental in the future, but at least this time, this is the state of the art. Now, where did all the mass come from? or all the matter come from, or all the energy come from? Well, actually, uh, uh, quite a while ago, back in the 30s, Hubble discovered that uh, uh, galaxies that were moving uh, uh, the farthest away were moving away faster at that time. And he was able to establish, based on this, and looking at the Doppler effect on multiple stars at distances, uh, uh, what is called the Hubble constant. And from the velocity of these stars, you can predict how far away they were based on that. In, uh, conversely, you could also develop a good estimation of the age of the universe based on that expansion. 
uh, and he came up with the answer of 14.4 billion years, which isn't very far off just using this equation. Now, uh, th this was important, and uh, it showed that uh, uh, space was expanding. But it also led to the conclusion if space is constantly expanding in every direction, if you go backwards, what does it lead to? And what does it lead to? The Big Bang, okay? And so that's, that's where we're going, heading to. Now, the Hubble's law shows that the stars are receding, and it's just a, a picture showing that a very distant galaxy, a distant galaxy, and nearby galaxy, and showing how the, the red shifted the farther to the right, the farther away they are <coughs> to go along with this. And like I said, again, this inferred the Big Bang theory. What is even uh, maybe more profound, well, or equally profound, is more recently it's been shown that e the remotest galaxies are not just moving away at a faster speed, but they're accelerating. And it has profound impact for what is the ultimate fate of this universe. Now, just briefly go over the Big Bang here. Uh, it, it, incredible amount of events in an incredible short time. There was an infinite uh, uh, pinpoint or uh, singularity of energy at one time, and it started rapidly expanding. Presumably started from a virtual particle, which I'll talk about in a little bit, but at 10 to the minus 43rd seconds, at a temperature of 10 to the 34th Kelvin, just astronomical temp temperatures, you had all the forces being equal, the four we were talking about, they were all combined, and the density of the universe was profound, but it was all in the form of energy. Remember, E equals mc squared. 10 to the minus 36 seconds, the temperature was down to 30, 10 to the 32nd. At this time, there was inflation, and I think probably most of you have heard that term, inflation, and this resulted in the creation of particles. There were felt to be X bosons that were formed, which I didn't talk about, but anyhow, they led to particles, and antiparticles. And remember I talked about symmetry and how the uh, weak force doesn't behave it? Well, these X bosons were uh, the weak force particles at the origin of the universe. And what happened was there were more particles formed than antiparticles. Only one in a billion difference, but that was enough to form all the matter in the universe. Anyhow, as things cool down, you've got the quarks to finally form into the hadrons, again, new neutrons and protons, got a little bit cooler, still hotter than hell. The density of the universe was the same as the nucleus, which is incredibly dense, of course. A little bit later, you got electrons and neutrons and protons, neutrinos and radiation starting to form, and then uh, the neutrons <coughs> left most of the atoms at, at, at one second. Now, <coughs> slowing down to four minutes, we had the nucleosynthesis. Yep. Nick, since you were there, is that all this? <laughs> I made a mistake. I could never have done it. You remember when helium and hydrogen, those were all the major things synthesized at first, and they were split apart so fast they couldn't coalesce to form larger things at that time. 30 minutes, you had the complete uh, elimination of particles and antiparticles, so you had one in a billion particles left. Uh, something profound happened at 300,000 years, a temperature of 6,000, which isn't very hot, that's like the surface of the sun. You have what was called the decoupling area. And energy and matter kind of quit interaction, interacting, going back into each other, and the electrons started to attack the nuclei. And what was a huge ball of plasma soup and light, all of a sudden, almost instantaneously, turned to darkness as these coupled, and it released the photons from the initial Big Bang that went out into space and spread out all this time. Now that, uh, that uh, energy or the photons that were released at that time are the basis of the uh, cosmic background radiation that is out there and helped uh, people, uh, once they were able to analyze it, to come back with more conclusions about the origin of the universe. The interesting thing I think about that is when we all had the old antennas on our TV and we had the static on our TV, we were watching the cosmic background radiation. In other words, we were seeing the radiation from the Big Bang. Now, after that many, uh, you know, 13 billion years, uh, the uh, space is expanding and it's stretching out those uh, photons. So they were out to seven centimeters in the microwave radiation length. So that's that's why you can see them on your TV set. Now, and I, I cable. We don't get it. <laughs> so, anyhow. 
And 10 to 6 years, you finally got uh, matter developing, and there were enough wrinkles in space time such that you could get the uh, gravity to pull uh, atoms together, and you could start forming stars and galaxies. And 10 to 10, you got the Milky Way. Actually, I'm out of line there. 10 to 10, you got the Sun and Moon. That was 5 billion years ago, Sun and Moon. Planets uh, formed, and uh, now, uh, 1.4 to the 10th years from the Big Bang, the temperature of the universe is now 2.7 degrees Kelvin, and you can go backwards, knowing how heat dissipates, and go back to 2.7, go back to the original temperature, you can predict also how uh, the age of the universe based on energy dissipation over that time, and it correlates perfectly with the Big Bang. All right. All right, so anyhow, the Big Bang explains that inflation created a negative gravitational energy, resulting in mass and the formation of particle and antiparticle pairs. Because of the break in the symmetry of the weak force that resulted in one out of a billion particles in excess of antiparticles to explain all the mass in the universe. By the way, um, Sakharov was the major person who uh, was the theoretician for that. Inflation explains the rate of expansion of the universe and its homogeneity in all directions, and it is the cause of the background radiation that we see on our TVs. Uh, again, they've been stretched out over time. From the singularity of a temperature of 10 to the 10K, expansion explains the current uh, temperature of 2.7 degrees Kelvin. Uh, there's just the equation there for figuring that. And the quantum fluctuations of the time of expansion led to subtle ripples where they were made it possible for matter to accumulate and to form stars. It was perfectly homogeneous, it would be due disseminated, and especially with increasing expansion, you would have never had planets or, or uh, stars. So inflation is the one time when uh, the speed of light was exceeded? Yes, exactly. How is that? And remember, it's space-time. And, and if you do the math on this and how big it enlarged over that period of time, Drew, was it that bad? <laughs> I don't understand any of that. <laughs> Yeah, uh, the space-time is expanding. Uh, the mass couldn't have, and energy couldn't, is my understanding, but space-time for some reason can't. And this tough stuff. Anyhow, yet, uh, astrophysics, we're going back to the age and dimensions of the universe. Now that we have a universe, you can calculate the age of the universe from, from Hubble's constant. Uh, uh, and I'm going to go over this quick because I think I am still going to time. I'm not too bad. Okay. Uh, based on the calculations from the Doppler effects and, the, uh, and looking at actually at uh, uh, other means as well, the Sun and the solar system is 4.5 billion years old, the universe 13.8 billion years old. If you want to date the age of stars, you can do that by ra radionuclei dating of supernova meteorites, and they do land on the Earth from time to time. Now, how do you find the distance to stars, and, and, and how do you determine the size of the universe? We use parallax, and you remember from high school uh, physics or math, you can uh, do, use that up to 30 parsecs, and a parsec is 3.26 light years, so 30 parsecs is basically 100 light years. After that, it, it doesn't work because you can't get a baseline for the parallax uh, easily. Uh, so you. you can go by the brightness of and the temperature of stars. If you know the absolute brightness of a star, you can tell the distance. But that's, that's easier said than done, because you don't know how far away they are. But there are standard candles that I will talk about where they know pretty much what the temperature of that object should be and therefore can calculate it. You can also do it from a knowledge of the way stars evolve, and they have different temperatures at different uh, states in their evolution. Same thing, there are standard uh, amounts of light that are giving off at certain uh, distances, and they can calculate that out. It is complicated, though. Now, the Cepheid variables, and that's one of your quiz questions here, there are stars that pulsate with regular rhythm related to uh, brightness. Again, it's a standard candle because they know the brightness of that should come from a Cepheid variable. And this is good to 5 million parsecs, so it gets pretty far out there. Uh, what has been used uh, a lot recently and was one that proved the uh, accelerating expansion of the universe was using type 1 supernovas. And again, it's a standard candle. What happens, it's a supernova created from a white dwarf in a binary system where the binary star is being absorbed in black dwarf. 
it gets it, it gets enough uh, uh, mass to explode. It has a, a fairly fixed amount of energy that it gives, and so forth, and therefore um, luminosity. And they can use that as a standard candle. And again, I alluded to the red ship is is good to very long distances. You know, it's not all that accurate, but when you're talking about 14 billion years old, being off by 200 million is not that bad. Okay. So the, the next slide just shows this whole principle of the brightness and luminosity is that it is proportional one over the distance squared. So if you know exactly how much light's coming off, you can predict the distance. The next slide is just a summary of these looking at the top part. I see it here. Here. This is parallax. You can measure stars out as far as Polaris or the North Star. If you look up there. Where did mine go? There it is. Anyhow, for the Cepheid variables, those rotating stars uh, that give off certain standard luminosity, you can go out to Andromeda Galaxy. So you go pretty far out. And I lost it. There it is. And then, of course, the uh, the supernova we we're talking about, and finally, you go to red ships from going out to the very end of the universe. We're not quite quite out to the end of the universe, but we're very darn close. Now, sources matter. Now, you, you got hydrogen and helium at the time of the Big Bang, but how do you get the rest of the elements? So, eventually, gravity accumulates enough energy uh, again to form a fusion of uh, hydrogen uh, and the formation of helium in stars. And, of course, it emits light and in the form of E equals mc squared. And it gets hotter and hotter. As these heavier elements form, they start sinking to the center of the star. That creates more gravity. It creates more heat. And you can get the generation of larger and larger atoms. So going down in this uh, generation of elements, you see that you can go helium burnings. Once you form the helium from hydrogen, then you can get four helium atoms together and you form uh, carbon. You have to have a very hot temperature to do that. Now that forms, and it sinks deeper, creates more gravity, creates more heat, and then you get carbon burning. So you get two carbon atoms and you can form, uh, you know, sodium and magnesium, but you have, it's getting hotter and hotter. Eventually you get to up to oxygen by adding a helium to the carbon, and then you can form silicon, sulfur, etc., etc. You get in the picture here. And finally, you get to silicon burning in the middle of the star. Again, all that gravity created, tremendous temperatures, and you can form uh, all the elements up to iron. Iron is the last one you can form uh, in a star, okay? To get all the other heavier elements beyond that requires endothermic input, and, and that happens with the supernova, which creates all the heavier elements. And so what was it? The uh, Crosby, Stills, and Nash song about... We are stardust, uh, we really are. We're formed from all of these. We're formed from supernovas, and then supernovas release all their elements, and they form more stars that collect together with all these heavier elements. And the end result of all this is uh, obviously uh, everything that we can, uh, everything we have on Earth. Now, just a quick uh, a summary again of a similar thing. This just shows the reaction that forms helium uh, from hydrogen in stars. It's called a proton-proton train reaction. And, and basically, you form deuterium and tritium. They collide together, and they form helium, and they release a tremendous amount of energy in the form of gamma rays. I should mention, though, that you can form helium from other cycles. I didn't cover all of it. There's a carbon-nitrogen-oxygen cycle that generates helium as well. But I didn't want to go into that. OK, again. Uh, formation of the heavier elements, I just alluded to this, and you can just go down to the picture on the right corner, which you can't see because it's obscured. Basically what it shows is that in the middle of here, they, again, they, whoops. as you get into the middle, you get heavier and heavier elements. The lighter ones get pushed out, and so you have all the different elements formed like an onion ring. And again, eventually, uh, it explodes in a supernova if it's heavy enough uh, and, and creates all the elements up to iron. Now, the, the end result is creating all the beautiful things in nature. And I love this side. I put in every talk uh, just a spectacular picture of what is the end up of all that stardust. Now, 
what happens to stars? We've got them formed, we have them forming all the elements. Uh, what happens to them over time? Well, if they're 1 20th to 1 quarter the size of the sun, uh, they don't form supernovas, and they eventually uh, 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 cool down gradually and go from white to brown to black dwarf stars and get smaller and smaller. They get heavier and he or they get denser and denser, but they get smaller and smaller. The repulsion of electrons prevent them from getting any heavier, but even at that density, it's tons per cubic inch. Most of these stars, the black dwarfs, are just a few thousand uh, miles in diameter. Because they're black and they no longer give off light, you can't see them. Now, a star 1.4 to 2 times the time, uh, size of the sun can form what are called neutron stars, which end up in pulsars and in some cases, and I'll talk about that. They are uh, repulsed at the hadron. In other words, they crush beyond the electrons and, and form like one huge nucleus. They all become neutron because the protons uh, are absorb uh, 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 electrons and become neutrons. And so they're called neutron stars. They're just heavily dense neutrons. Again, they capture those electrons and become neutrons. And they get very, very small, but incredibly dense. And it's 100 million tons per cubic inch. Now, if you've got two times to eight times the size of the sun, you can form black holes. You have enough density. Or, or enough mass, rather, to create so much gravity that it collapses to an infinite, a, an infinite density or a singularity. Uh, the term, uh, you can figure this out for all different stars and stuff. It's called Chandrasekhar's limit, and you can figure out exactly mathematically how much mass you have to overcome uh, uh, the uh, ability of gravity to hold it uh, apart. I said that wrong, but you know what I mean. <laughs> Anyhow. At eight times the sun, you get supernovas, black holes, new stars, stars. When ga gra uh, galaxies, whole clumps of stars collapse, you get massive black holes. And basically, at the center of every uh, a galaxy is a massive black hole. Now, this just reiterates that. You've got stellar nebulae. You've got all the dust that finally accumulates to form uh, enough mass to uh, form a star with nuclear fusion. If it's big enough on the uh, on the bottom, you can get the black holes and neutron stars. If it's not big enough, you, you get uh, smaller stars that eventually dissipate slowly over time. Now, what is a neutron star and what are pulsars? Again, I talked about the neutron stars are incredibly dense. The density of a nucleus, a matchbox would weigh 5 trillion tons. The temperature of them is 600,000 degrees uh, Kelvin. Um, like I said, it eventually collapses all the way down to formation, just neutrons by electron capture. This, the picture up above on the right shows how big a neutron star is relative to the Earth and a white dwarf, obviously microscopic. The picture at the bottom lower right shows that a neutron star would be like the size of uh, Manhattan and a black hole, which is even a much smaller, just because the, the increased gravity pulls it into such a small size and such an incredible density. Now. Uh, I'm not going to talk much about black holes. That's uh, hours and hours to talk by itself. But it, it's a singularity with infinite density, just kind of the opposite of the Big Bang. You can't see it, but you can infer it by gravitational effects. Obviously, it's called black because it doesn't give off light. Uh, it, uh, recently, we showed that they have gravitational waves, as we discussed earlier. They do are visible in a way indirectly by forming what are called accretion disks, as they absorb other stars or or the galaxy, the energy is going down toward the black hole and it emits a tremendous amount of x-rays and this increased density can cause what is called gravitational lensing. You look at a black hole or you don't see it, but you can infer it because of the bending of light around it. Now, you've heard of the term quasars. There used to be TVs called quasars many, many years ago. And they are quasi-stellar radio sources. And they are very distant, like in the 12 billion years of age based on redshift. They are the most luminous objects, up to a thousand times brighter than our, our galaxy. And the energy emitted appears to be the result of collisions of galaxies with the result in formation of those black holes. Now, you're probably here. I know I'm here. <laughs> Mr. Osborne, may I be excused? My brain is full. And I'm, I'm definitely there. But you have to suffer a little bit more. Anyhow. 
We've created, created all the familiar matter in the world as we see it, but it only accounts for a fraction of the matter in the universe. This shows you just the fraction of visible stuff down in uh, lower, uh, yeah, it's too hard to find. And, and, and the dark matter is 23% of the matter in Earth, and, and we're going to talk about dark energy briefly in a little bit. Now, what are you down to a minute or two? Oh, is that right? <laughs> okay, I'll raise you. Make sure you talk dark about matter. the ripping effect at the end so we know where we're headed. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm going to do the dark matter real quick here. Anyhow, we know that there's more out there. And how do we know? Because even as early as 1933, Swicky noted that spiral galaxies were moving too fast, rotating too fast, and the only way to explain it was to have 400 times the mass. And being able to calculate the energy from the beginning of the Big Bang, it also supported that there's got to be a lot more mass out there than we can see. In 1975, it was shown that the velocity of the stars and spiral galaxies all move at the same speed. And that shouldn't be the case. Anything close should move fast, and the ones way out far should obviously suggest that there was mass out there that was holding it together. So at any rate, so there has to be more out there. Now, what is it? Now, it's not as critical to know now as it was 15, 20 years ago, because we know what the ultimate fate of the universe is probably going to be. But before, the hypothesis was, do we have enough matter in the universe to form gravitational effects that will bring all the mass in the universe back into a singularity, in other words, a big crunch, just the opposite of the Big Bang? Or is there not enough that we're going to keep on expanding uh, uh, forever? And I'm going to skip that. And the apocalypse came in 1998. We examined Type 1a supernova. Remember, I said that was a standard candle uh, to measure remote galaxies. And what they found out was they were accelerating and moving away from the uh, center of the universe. And therefore, the universe is increasingly and more quickly expanding, which argues strongly that we're ever going to have a big crunch. Now, because that they found they say they have to come up with a new explanation. Why is the Earth expanding? And they came up with the concept of dark energy, which is the majority of energy mass, if you will, in the universe. Well, I think I found the source of dark energy, <laughs> even, even if scientists couldn't find it. And you know, look at his mouth. What do you think he's saying? <laughs> That's exactly what I said when <laughs> Len gave me this topic. <laughs> Anyhow, it resurrected the cosmologic constant that Einstein had predicted that he wanted to keep a static universe. In other words, that there is some kind of energy density intrinsic to space. In other words, that is an empty space out there that is keeping the universe expanding. Quantic mechanic theory uh, predicts that virtual particles are constantly forming in, uh, in at nuclear dimensions and creating particle and particle pairs that are causing, and again, this is in a vacuum, causing the release of gamma radiation, which is causing the expansion. So this is that explanation. In other words, you've got a vacuum in picture one, Two, out of nothing, and this is happening all the time in, in a vacuum, you're getting positrons and negatrons, or negatrons, electrons are forming, they collide and they release energy, and maybe this is the energy pulling it away. Now, what is the ultimate uh, fate of the, big, uh, of the universe? Well, uh, one is it does seem to be expanding, it's going to chill down. It'll take 10 to 117,000 years before everything breaks down entirely. But just to finish up quickly, the most recent theory is you'll have a big rip because there's so much new energy being formed out there that's pulling the universe so fast, it's going to go faster than the speed of light, and it's going to tear up the universe into bits and pieces. And it says here, the tenth, the tenth I think, seconds before the big rip, atoms uh, uh, ripped apart. 30 minutes before the Earth explodes, three months before the solar system breaks apart. Anyhow, you get the picture. And that will be the end, literally. Now, quiz. All right, ready? Everybody paying attention? Okay, which does the electron go to? I got to look too. Electron, electromagnetic radiation, remember that, those are your electrons. The pulsar is a rotating neutron star. Dark energy 
goes to the virtual particles, or could be virtual particles. The mass goes to the Higgs particle. Remember, you had to have the Higgs particle for mass. Stellar distances, you remember those stereo, seven yes. variables, the, the stars that uh, are, 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 are candles, if you will. Uh, uh, Lorentz transformations, that's the time dilation, how you can calculate how uh, much time slows down with the speed of light. Kobe radiation is the Big Bang radiation that's left over. We get on our TV antennas. Quantum chromodynamics is the strong force gauge field. In other words, the three different colors. Beta electron decay is from the weak force. And gluons are, I'll give you two, one answer. Gluons are rust. Quarks. Quarks. That's right. Quarks. That's my whole question. Okay. Amazing. Neutrons and protons. <laughs> but you're right, neutrinos don't. Neutrinos don't. And all those heavier elements like cog neutrinos and all that, they're, they don't have any effect whatsoever. But you remember I said we use positrons. We use beta emission electrons in nuclear uh, treatment of like thyroid cancer. So there's some. Thank you. So, Carrie, when you get those little glass bulbs with the flags inside, you shine a light on them and they start to spin. Which part of the Is that a photon? Yes, exactly. It shows that they behave like particles. Next week is dermatology. They're totally cool. Yeah, no. I remember that in high school. They're like abacatas. Found that the universe was expanding. So all the dark energy stuff is 